Ladies and gentlemen, please repeat after me. There can only be one me. There was no me before me. There will be no me after me. And since I'm the only me that the world will see, I will be the best me that I can be. Give yourselves a round of applause. Excellent. My, my number one goal in speaking today was to turn you all into rappers, and, and, I, and I did that. So I'm very excited. I'm very excited. None of you all can ever say that you came to an NSA convention and you didn't rap. So mission accomplished. But I, uh, in addition to that, I, I'm very honored to be here to speak about this thing we call encouraging courageous conversations. And as we talk today, I'm coming from the belief that we're dealing with so many challenges right now where we need each and every one of you to be the best that you can be. We go out and do so much work every single day to help companies when their businesses are on the line. But the question I have for you today is what are you willing to do for a country that's on the line? Because I believe as we become more divided today, the very fabric of this nation is on the line. And I believe that only we as speakers can help save it. I fundamentally have learned that. In January of this year, the Trump administration sent me to Rwanda to conduct leadership trainings. And when you visit Rwanda for the first time, the first thing they ask you to do is visit the Rwandan Genocide Memorial. And as many of us know, the genocide took place over 20 years ago in 94. Oh, about a million people were slaughtered in a period of a month. And I'm a history buff, and I read, and I saw Hotel Rwanda, and I felt like I knew the history. But when I, so I was very, I, I wasn't too thrilled to go. I didn't think I could really learn much. But from the door, I was floored. The first thing I saw was the mass graves. And many people don't know this, but to date in Rwanda, they still have open mass graves to bury bodies that are still being found over 20 years after the genocide. Was not aware of that. Then I walked into the memorial itself, and I saw the skulls of many people who were slaughtered. Then I walked into another room where they had pictures, family members of people who were slain contributed pictures of their family members, their name, the date of birth, and how they died. I went into a room devoted to children, saw pictures, children, as young as nine months old, one baby I saw, Beautiful face, beautiful outfit, method of death, head bashed against the ground. I saw a two-year-old, method of death, hacked to death with a machete. And as somebody who has been a, a former youth chair for this convention, I immediately thought about our children and how, given any particular circumstance, they could easily be a picture on that wall. And then I walked into the last room I visited and I saw something that scared me even more than everything else that I saw. And it made me realize that the Rwandan genocide could happen in America today. I never thought that before. As a student of history, I, I've learned that genocides have different origins. Some are rooted in political land grabs, some are rooted in economics, some are rooted in religion, all different types of things. But what led primarily to the Rwandan genocide were media campaigns of misinformation. Deliberate strategies to misinform people so that people literally ended up hunting their neighbors. One video I saw, a woman said, I had literally paid for this child's school fees and the next day, he and his friends were hunting us. 
deliberate campaigns of misinformation. In our society today, we are suffering from deliberate campaigns of misinformation targeting individuals and targeting particular groups. And it doesn't matter what your politics are. What matters is that we are in decline because of campaigns of misinformation. Even at the university where I teach in Washington, D.C., and across the country, universities are scrambling because you know what we're finding? We're finding that students are coming into college now and they don't know how to process information that is fact or fiction. They don't know, as we know, that when you're reading a study, say about the benefits or the risks of sugar, that you should read who sponsored the study because that might lead to a particular bias, right? They don't know, for example, that when you may see somebody on, on Twitter or Facebook with a million followers, and people think just because they have a million followers, they actually know what they're talking about, so we have to believe them. They're not learning how to differentiate. And so my, what I realize is that if we're struggling with this as a nation in our universities, we're struggling with this everywhere in our society, most demonstrated by the fact that during the last campaign, somebody put out on Facebook that Hillary Clinton was selling child slaves out of a restaurant, Comet Pizza, down the street from where I teach at American University. And somebody literally drove across state lines, went into the restaurant, and shot it up with families there. You see, we can laugh and pontificate about these things, but these are things that are actually happening in this country. What's also happening, which is a fact in this country, is that in 2017 was the first time we had an increase in hate crimes in over a decade. So maybe you're not personally affected by what's happening, but what I would say is you're not personally affected by what's happening yet. You're not personally affected yet. And I believe, as Dr. King said, is that all it takes for evil to prevail is for good-minded people, good-natured people to do nothing. And so what I want to share with you today is how we as speakers, the work that we can do to help save this nation. Because if we can do it for our businesses, we can do it for our country. And full disclosure, in addition to being a speaker, in addition to being a professor, I am an activist. That is who I am at my core. And I'm not calling on everyone in this room to, to be an activist and get out into those streets, regardless of what, what belief you have, regardless of what candidates you support. That's not the point. What I'm asking you to do is to simply do what you can with what you have, where you are, as Arthur Ashe said, to make a difference. So let me give you four simple steps that you can do on, on, on a daily basis to help our country get to where it needs to be. Number one is listen. Everybody say listen. You have to do what Les Brown said when he talked about you have to listen to the listening. So in the companies that you work with, what does that look like? Well, one of the things that you could be doing is creating new questionnaires to really help engage people who are not speaking that much because they feel like they're being marginalized in their organization. Maybe instead of just speaking to the person who's bringing you in, just speaking to the executive team, you can go out across the, the companies that you're working with and, and ask people who are not speaking up to get their perspectives on things. Because as somebody who has worked with both administrations, Trump and the Obama administration, I realized something. In the schools that I was going to to do the work, when, when Obama won, I had some people, when I walked in, I had leaders telling me, don't talk about the election because there are teachers here who are still upset. And then when Trump won and I went into schools, I heard the same thing. Don't talk about the election because people are too upset. But see, listening to the listening, one of the things you realize when you walk around the school is I learned a couple of things. I learned that in many of our schools across the country, when Obama won, many black students stood for the Pledge of Allegiance for the first time. There's a story there. But there's also a story in that many white students stopped standing for the first time. You have to be able to see that when you're going into businesses. And I'm talking about a school, but in the corporations and the companies that you work with, every time there's a shift in, in, in leadership, 
you're going to deal with new challenges in your organization. So you can't go in there and regurgitate the same information because the climate might be different. So we have to do our work as speakers to listen better to the listening. And then that leads us to empower. Everybody say empower. Once we see the people who are most marginalized, we have to develop strategies to empower them. What does that look like? Well, you know, if you're dealing with a company or an organization where you have a lot of type A people and everybody's speaking up, maybe you can create anonymous surveys where people who are afraid to speak can start to share their opinions, to share their thoughts about how, as, 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 as an older white man, I don't feel welcome here. As, as, as somebody who is homosexual, I no longer feel like I belong. As a black male in this space, I feel like I'm being targeted. Most likely, people are not going to speak up and verbalize that because they're afraid of being condemned. Because we are in an organization that we're called on to speak up, but we live in a society where people choose to speak down on people. So you can start to create the strategies and the techniques that empower them by getting different voices to speak up in different ways. Which leads us to another thing that we can do is accountability. Everybody say accountability. We have to work to hold people accountable. If we can do it in our businesses, we can do it for this country. The fact of the matter is, we see that immigration is a huge debate going on in this country right now, and you can have your opinions on where you stand on it, and that's completely fine. I am generally fine with everybody having their opinions on anything except anything dealing with the Boston Celtics, because as you can tell from my name, I was born in a very far away place called Boston, Massachusetts. And yes, and if you're not a Celtics fan, I might question your upbringing and maybe think you weren't raised right. But other than that, we can talk about anything else, anything else. And so we may have different views on, on immigration, but we can all agree that a fourth grade child shouldn't be walking into a school and hearing students chanting, build a wall, which is happening now. We need to hold our, our, our people accountable, our children accountable, our children who are upstairs in the convention on their worst day, they wouldn't do something like that because we taught them how to be accountable. In your businesses, when you're hearing ignorance be spewed, you need to hold people accountable. In your churches, in your religious institutions, because the most separated and most segregated part of America to this day is our church on Sunday afternoon. We're still separated, still in our little circles. And in our circles, you get to hear things with your people that I'll never hear, and I get to hear things when I'm with my people that you'll never hear. My people could be anybody. It could be economic, it could be racial, it could be regional, whatever it is. But when we hear those things, we have to challenge it. We have to hold people accountable. I saw Geraldo Rivera and, and, and Sean Hannity having a discussion about some policy of Trump's. And these are two of Trump's, if you don't know, biggest supporters. And Hannity was saying, we love Trump, we have to support this. And, and Geraldo said, yes, we love him, but this particular action is wrong. And we need to speak to him on that. Because the way that we, hold, we, we celebrate our leaders is not by giving them blank slates, but by holding them accountable. And so, and I'm not saying anything new. This is the work of Mark Sanborn. This is the work of anybody out there who talks about it. You go into your businesses and you see these bottom lines and profit suffering and you say, well, we need to do this. And they say, well, no, everything's just working fine. Well, look at your bottom line. It's not. That's accountability. And if we can do it there, we can do it in all of our other spaces. And that leads us to the last one. Everybody say diversity. diversity. Look, when people think about diversity, they primarily think about gender and race. And yes, those are important issues, but I have never read a story, Lenora, that says that companies that are less diverse are the most successful. Every study that's out there talks about the companies that embrace diversity are more successful. And so when we talk about <laughs> diversity, it, it is gender, it is race, but it's also age, it's also religion, it's also people who are dealing with different physical challenges, it's also sexual preference, region of the country, region of the world. Many of the companies you see getting in trouble right now on social media is because they don't have a diverse group of people and on their staff, and now they're getting exposed to the rest of the world. So that's something you can look at when you're working with your businesses. What's there as it relates to diversity, but you also need to watch the company that you keep as it relates to diversity. I read a study in the Washington Post that said that 
over 70% of white Americans have no black friends. Today. So most likely what we're going to get from a particular group is going to be made up by what we see on television. Because as Donna Ford said, the less we know about each other, the more we make up. And that is leading to many of the challenges that we are having today. And listen, family, I'll be very honest with you. I tried to be that person who goes into companies, just speaks, works on giving an awesome performance, get the check and go home, deposit it and smile. I try to be that person to just say, oh, I'm working with all these multiple associations and not speak on anything. But I got to tell you, when I see a police officer who's not going to come home because he died, she died trying to service a warrant, when I see a soldier that dies because of, of a war that we didn't need to be involved in in the first place, when I see an unarmed child being slain unnecessarily, it could be by, by an officer or by someone in their neighborhood, when I see people being taunted just because of what they wear, I can't be silenced because I've learned that silence is compliance. And so we have to realize we spend so much time condemning people like Hitler, but one of the things we don't understand is that everything that Hitler did was legal because of the laws that were created through complacency from others. So I talked about listening. I talked about empowering. I talked about holding people accountable, and I talked about diversity. That spells out lead. Everybody say lead. We need to lead the charge because many people don't know how to make this happen. If you watch what I do on social media, I engage in debates. I'm critical of every president. I don't care who comes in. But when I'm talking to people, I don't demean them. I don't name call. I don't, I don't shut them down because that's not productive. But that's what we're doing today. You know, social media used to be the place that people went to reconnect. But now it's the place where we go to disconnect. And we need to teach people how to do better. We are losing our way in this country, but as speakers, we can show people the way. And people talk a lot about whether America is great, and of course this is a great country. And I believe that we can do more in what we do to keep it great and to make it become even greater. So as you leave here today and you go back into your businesses and you go back into your communities, I want you to ask yourself, how can you be a better leader, L-E-A-D? When you're in your churches, when you're in your synagogues, in your mosques, when you're hearing ignorance be spewed, how can you better challenge that? How can you in your own spots help us stay great? Stay great. It's not about becoming great because we are already great. So as I close with this poem, I want you to remember that this organization was founded on the principle of not arguing over small pieces of a pie but coming together and making a bigger pie. I believe that we need to do the work to make a bigger and better, greater American pie. And I dedicate this poem to you and to that cause. They say that greatness is a choice, but what have you chosen? You've been frozen in time and broken in mind. For too long, the same song playing in your head, living in breath but better off dead. But who said that you didn't have the power? Who said this is not your hour? You've been showered with a steady stream of words that kill your dreams. But since you're still breathing, then someone has lied to you, tried to deny you of your own potential inside you. If you just decide to, let no one deride you. Don't even let them get beside you as you unearth the new you. Stop listening to naysayers and decide to do you. No more pity parties, sob stories, and boo-hoos. If no one told you that you're great, then let me be the first to. If you develop the thirst to drink from face fountain, you'll develop the might to move mountains. You see, we remove tons of dirt to find one ounce of gold. So I ask you to remove tons of hurts and just uncover one ounce of your soul. You'll set yourself on a true path of excellence, getting out of your passenger seat and driving your own car, reaching for the moon but maybe only landing among the stars. You see, you have greatness inside you, but you must choose to be great. Blaze a path of excellence, leaving fear in your wake. All you need is already inside you. You just must believe in yourself. Grow towards your greatness and discover your true wealth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.